Today, we're going to cover um, the class of linear smoothers, which uh, encompasses all the estimators we've learned so far. We're just going to talk about a few nice properties of this class, and then we're going to get to their deficiencies, why you might want to go, go beyond linear smoothers, even though what we've learned so far, which have been k-nearest neighbors, kernel smoothing, um, splines, and then reproducing kernel Hilbert space estimators, all those are linear smoothers. We're going to learn that um, in some situations you may want to be, go beyond just linear smoothers because they don't perform very well. So uh, before I start, are there any questions about stuff we've learned so far? No? OK. Um, yeah, I also, I guess it depends on how fast we go today. Um, maybe halfway through I'll see what the level of interest seems to be after the first half, because we could either do two more lectures or one more on non-parametric regression. We could either do all of today on adaptive estimation and then all of next time on high dimensional non-parametric regression, or we could squeeze that into one lecture. Um, I guess I'll just try to gauge to see how, how interested people are at the halfway point. So everything we've talked about so far fits into the class of what we call linear smoothers. We talked about these the second lecture. And these are estimators that, you know, we get some training samples, x, i, y, i, i equals 1 to n. And we produce some fitted function f hat of x. And Linear smoothers have the following property, which is that if I look at y hat, which is the vector of predictions I would make at um, each of these input points xi, so what are the smooth values of yi, which is given by f hat of x1 all the way through f hat of xn, then linear smoothers have the following feature y hat is just some matrix times y. S is called the smoothing matrix. And it can, de can depend on x. That's perfectly fine. It can depend on other things like a tuning parameter. So uh, if we were doing smoothing splines, this could depend on lambda, the penalty parameter. If we were doing um, k nearest neighbors, this is going to depend on k, other things like that. But it can't depend on y. That's the important part. The relationship between y hat and y is just some matrix times y. OK? So everything we've learned so far falls into this class. These are all linear smoothers They're because the fitted values are linear functions of y. They don't produce linear f hats as a function of x, right? That's a common source of confusion. I think it's just a, maybe it's a, you know, a fortunate kind of clash of nomenclature. But f hat of x, for example, for splines, is for a cubic spline, is a piecewise cubic function of x. It's not linear. It's not a linear function of x. We're not referring to the fact that f hat of x um, is like given by linear regression or something. We're, when we talk about a linear smoother, it means that the, the fitted values, y hat, which is the vector f hat x1 through f hat xn, just some linear transformation of y. Okay? So just to recap, um, linear regression is a case of a linear smoother. If I were to linear regress, linearly regress um, y i on the xi's, then these would just be given by the hat matrix, right? If I write x as a matrix, this is x times x transpose x inverse x transpose. It's a fitted value from linear regression. K nearest neighbors are also. An example of that, right? Each, each of these is just given by like a local average of the y's. So the, the rows of s just contain 1 over k in certain spots. Splines and smoothing splines. So whether or not the knots are fixed, which is what I'm calling, I'll just call it generically splines, or smoothing splines where they're 
placed at every x point that's that's also true um, kernels it's true for both smoothing kernels and Mercer kernels so both sets of the word kernels and local polynomial regression everything we've learned so what are some of the properties of linear smoothers um, we already learned one of their properties, which is that the degrees of freedom of y hat, which we think of as the effective number of parameters that's being used in producing the fit. All right, we had a definition for this from the second lecture. Uh, it's easier to think of it actually in its matrix form. It's the trace of the covariance between y hat and y. Right, so it's the sum of uh, the covariance of each y hat i with the corresponding observation yi. Add those up and divide by sigma squared. That's a measure of kind of like the effective number of parameters, the complexity of, that is uh, given to the fit y hat. And for linear smoothers, um, we calculate this with just the trace of s. Right? If you just plug in s times y here, covariance is linear. So it comes out, and we get the trace of s times the covariance of y with itself. That's just sigma squared i. So it's just a trace of s, and then the sigma squareds cancel. So that's nice, because now for any linear smoother, um, we have a measure for its complexity. And this was useful for various reasons. Right? For example, suppose you wanted to fit um, you want to do kernel smoothing, and you want to see how that compared against smoothing splines. You weren't sure what to use. So you're going to compare kernel smoothing versus smoothing splines. What are their two parameters that they use? They each have a tuning parameter. What are they for each of the methods? For this guy, it's lambda. And for this guy, it's h. The bandwidth versus h, uh, the bandwidth h versus the, the penalty parameter lambda. These are on different scales. They actually have even different kind of directions in terms of the implied complexity, right? As um, oh no, actually that's not true. So as h gets bigger, the kernel smoothing operation we think is less complex, right? Because they're averaging over less points. It's the same thing. Is, same is true with lambda. So they actually have this. In a sense, they do have the same direction, but they're on totally different scales. If I were to compare kernel smoothing at h equals 1 versus smoothing splines at lambda equals 1, we don't know if that's a meaningful comparison or not. And I could, you know, I could produce two error curves, right? I could do something like I could ask for, um, the, say, the CV error for kernel smoothing for, versus h versus the CV error for um, smoothing splines versus h, and maybe that these have some shapes, like maybe this tells me it looks something like this, and maybe this tells me it looks something like that. And we say, okay, the best lambda looks like it's lambda equals 10, and the best bandwidth looks like it's h equals, say, 1.5. But what are we comparing here? We still don't know whether or not lambda equals 10 and h equals 1.5 is comparable, right? Because they're, they're on different scales. So we could actually reparameterize entirely in terms of degrees of freedom. That's one way to put these two methods on equal footing. And so instead of writing uh, h and lambda on the x-axis, I'm saying we can produce a picture that looks like this. The CV error for, um, for kernel smoothing versus the effective degrees of freedom at every bandwidth, which is given by taking the trace of its, hat mat of its uh, smoothing matrix at h. And I could produce the analogous plot for smoothing splines which is the degrees of freedom at lambda, give me the trace of its completely separate smoothing matrix as a function of lambda. And I might see that, um, you know, some, something like this, say. And then I might think, ah, so these actually are on the same scale. I plot degrees of freedom on the same scale here. And it looks like, well, if they achieve about the same CVR, say, but, um, Kernel smoothing does it with a simpler model. Smoothing splines require somehow a more complex model 
to achieve this roughly the same cross-validation error. That's, I guess, an informative comparison. It's completely a thought experiment at this point, and this is not, you know, supposed to be any like rule of thumb for these two methods. But I'm just trying to give an example of how you might use degrees of freedom as a way of putting methods on equal footing. And you'd do this in general if you had, you know, if you're comparing other methods like reproducing kernel Hilbert space estimators or KNN or whatever. Okay. That's one. Uh, I guess I'd call it informal use of degrees of freedom because we're not actually, you know, using it in any formal sense to estimate test error, but we're just using it as kind of a, a mechanism for comparing things. Um, we also learned, however, that uh, a more concrete use for degrees of freedom is it gives us an um, estimate for the test error. That was something we learned in the second lecture. I'll just remind you what it was. And it tells us that let's just take y minus y hat squared. So the, this is the training error. And let's add to it 2 sigma squared over n times the degrees of freedom of y hat, which in the case of, um, of the linear smoother is just this, right? And this forms us an estimate t hat, and I claim that the expected value of t hat is equal to t, which is the expectation of, I just want to make sure I use the same notation as in the notes. I guess I called it y prime minus y hat squared over n, where y prime was an IID copy of y. We did, we did this math, I think, in the second lecture to, to prove this. So this gives us a way to, to do an unbiased test error estimation. And we can also use it to, to choose a parameter like, I said you could use cross-validation to choose a parameter like the bandwidth or lambda. Of course, that's a very practical way to do that. We talked about the advantages of this uh, second lecture. Another way to do that would be to use uh, this formula. So I might choose, say I'm, I'm doing kernel smoothing. I, I want to choose h as the parameter. I'll choose h to be the minimizer over all bandwidths. And I'll, I'll just choose a grid of bandwidths to try of this criterion. Right? So it'll just be 1 over n, y minus y hat of h squared um, plus 2 sigma squared over n times the trace of s of h. Just to remind you of the advantages and disadvantages, this is, has the advantage that this is computationally very cheap. It doesn't require us to refit anything, right? We just take the estimators that we fit already over the sequence of bandwidths that we're interested in, and then we take the trace of the smoothing matrices. Usually we, ha usually we can do this pretty cheaply um, because whatever method we're we're using to fit will usually tell us what the smoothing matrix is. And versus cross-validation, it's computationally more expensive, right? We have to actually refit it over subsets of the data points. Here we would probably just pick out pairs x, i, y, i at random to form folds. Um, but it has the advantage of that it doesn't assume as much as this. So this assumes, the validity of this assumes that the x points are fixed. And the errors are IID. Right? And we've talked about wh why that may be not true as well. Cross-validation as doesn't assume any of that. It just assumes you have IID pairs, X, I, Y, I. So those are two ways to choose the bandwidth. Any questions about that? Yeah? This is like the optimism that you were covering before? Right. This is another word for this part is the optimism. It's the difference between the expected tests and expected training errors. Um, 
So in some, some sense, I will just use degrees of freedom and optimism synonymously. I won't really distinguish from the two because they're just, they just differ by a constant factor, 2 sigma squared over n. Yeah. So um, you said that this can be much more efficient computationally, but yet everyone always seems to use cross-validation. And so is it because we're kind of wary of the fact that the epsilons are IID? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, people definitely do use cross-validation more often. You'll see this being used actually not too infrequently. Um, you just probably see it being used under a diff slightly different guise. So you, never, you probably don't see it written down like this, but remember, in regression, this was just P. Trace of the hat matrix was P. So this would be called, usually for regression, people call this the CP criterion. Um, and it's also it's the same thing as AIC in regression. So you would have learned that in other classes. Um, you're right, though, in general, especially when we're doing non-parametric regression, you know, you don't know if the variance of the epsilons, for example, is going to be the same at every point xi. So it may be su somewhat suspicious to assume they're IID if you have a heteroscedastic model. So people usually rely on cross-validation. I've also found that in practice, to be honest, this doesn't always work very well. It's just a practical observation. Um, it's true that this thing is an unbiased estimate of, of test error under these assumptions, but, you know, this, I found in practice that this maybe is, has high variance, so the curve you're minimizing over is just very wiggly. But it is an alternative to cross-validation when you maybe simply can't afford cross-validation if you have a really, really large problem. It's a good question. Um, here's a, a, a nice fact about linear smoothers in cross-validation. There's a formula that one can use for... Um, for a very fast version of leave one out cross validation. And again, I, I would have told you towards the start of class that I, I don't prefer leave one out. I prefer like five or tenfold cross validation. So that would be my heuristic recommendation. But people still do use leave one out cross validation. And for linear smoothers, there's a very nice fast formula for it. Uh, not all linear smoothers, sorry, for some linear smoothers. And I think that. I think on your next homework, you're actually going to show that this is true for smoothing splines. And um, maybe I'll, I'll have you also think about whether it's true or not for other linear smoothers. So leave one out cross-validation. Remember, we, we tried to compute this criterion, which is that We're going to take uh, turns leaving out each point, so leave out the, eight, the ith point. We're going to fit on all but the ith point. That's what this f hat of minus i is supposed to denote. And then we're going to look at the uh, error in fitting yi with our prediction at xi that we, you, that we formed with, with all but the ith point. This is leave one out cross-validation. So generically, we're going to have to actually refit the model n times. And um, aside from being computationally expensive, I noted before that this estimate itself has high variance, which is kind of my same complaint with this one. So I recommend that we do uh, k-fold cross-validation, where we leave out chunks of data rather than just one at a time. But still, people tend to use this. So, and there's this nice computational uh, trick that you get with linear smoothers, which is the following. turns out that for some linear smoothers, And this is true of smoothing splines and kernel smoothing as examples. And it's an exact equality. It's not something that's like close in distribution. It's not something that holds with high probability. It's not asymptotic. It's an exact equality, which is that the leave one out cross validation error is same as, the same as kind of a weighted version of the training error. So there's no refitting required. I have to just look at the difference between yi and its training fit, f of xi, and I'm divide, I divide by 1 minus the ith element of the smoothing matrix, ith diagonal element of the smoothing matrix. Um, so 
this is quite a, maybe seem like quite a magical formula. Um, let's just think about a sufficient condition for this to be true. So if this were true, a sufficient condition would be that actually each, element, each of these things e equals each of these things in the sum. If every individual element were the same, then um, it would imply that this formula holds. So it's even stronger to assert that yi minus f hat minus i of xi um, is equal to the ith element of that sum. And it turns out that this is actually true for a lot of linear smoothers. And let's just rearrange this to see um, what this is saying, why this might be true. So I'm going to multiply. Actually, all I'm going to um, let's see. So let, let's yeah, let's write this out. Um, this is saying that f hat minus i of x i is equal to what I get when I subtract this part from y i. So it's equal to 1 minus s i i of y i minus y i minus f hat of x i over 1 minus s i i. It's just rearranging, right? And OK, let's work with the right hand side there. And so this y i and this y i cancel, right? And I, so I get minus, this should be a plus. So it's subtracting off this quantity. So I get f hat minus i of x i is equal to minus s i i of y i times y i um, plus f hat of x i divided by 1 minus s i i. And OK, and okay, that's, I guess, where we're going to leave it. So we'll just rearrange these two terms. So if that's true, by working backwards, it would be true that we get this magical formula for Lee Winnock cross validation. So that's a sufficient condition for any linear smoother to have this nice computational shortcut. What does this say? It helps to interpret what this says. Remember that, that uh, a linear smoother at the point xi right, is given by taking, um, so f hat of xi, we know by definition is sij times yj. So what we get by multiplying the uh, I throw the smoothing matrix by y. This is saying that, uh, well, when we, if we don't observe the ith point in our sample and you ask me to refit the linear smoother, I should get it by um, essentially summing up this over all but the ith point and then renormalizing just so that I have the right um, total sum of the smoothing weights. Right? I'm just getting rid of the fact that I, I'm not putting in SII. So this is just equal to the sum over j not equal to i of sij yj over 1 minus sii. So immediately you can see that's true with kernel smoothing, right? Or at least maybe you can do it as a mental exercise to convince yourself that it is true with kernel smoothing. Everything's going to work out with kernel smoothing. I just have to, I'm just changing essentially what points I'm taking into the sum for the kernel smoothing. Uh, it also is true for smoothing splines. That's something that you are going to approach on the homework next time. It's less obviously true, but it's true for them. So for either of those methods, you can do cross-validation in a pretty computationally efficient manner just with this thing. No refitting involved. Um, the last thing I, I 
should mention is generalized cross-validation, something you'll hear quite a lot, which is a, a twist on, um, on this leave-one-out cross-validation idea, where you take as a measure of the cross-validation error uh, almost that, but you replace SII by something. And you place it by the trace divided by n. So instead of taking the ith diagonal element of s, you take the average ith diagonal element of s. This is even more computationally efficient because oftentimes we can compute the trace. Like I said, we can compute the degrees of freedom, but we can't actually, it's maybe more expensive to compute the individual diagonal elements. So this is probably the fastest way to do an approximate cross validation and ends up being very close to leave one out for linear smoothers. Any questions about that? OK. These are very similar, by the way. This generalized cross-validation and this, they end up being extremely similar in practice in terms of what you get out of them. And in fact, you can see that as a fun exercise. You can look at, um, look at this approximation. So first order Taylor approximation will tell you that for small x, um, one, minus, 1 over 1 minus x squared is approximately 1 plus 2x. So apply that here. You'll see that what you get out is actually exactly the, um, this formula as, a, as an estimate of the test error. If we apply this approximation here. Any questions before we leave the linear smoother land? Okay. So linear smoothers are pretty great. There's a lot of them. We have some nice tools for what to do with them, like how to choose the tuning parameter. We have some shortcuts for cross-validation. We have something else that involves the uh, optimism. But they have their limitations. And these limitations can be pretty severe depending on what kind of problem you're trying to solve. Um, essentially, their limitations are that they are not adaptive. to the local degree of smoothness. So in other words, linear smoothers, they tend to make the non-parametric fit either very smooth throughout or very wiggly throughout, but they can't be locally adaptive. If you're trying to estimate a function that has a very kind of sharp degree of um, changes in its derivatives in one region of the domain, but in other, in other regions it's very smooth, then a linear smoother can't kind of simultaneously represent both of those behaviors. It's actually, I think, a very deep result that um, I think people still don't perfectly understand, but there's a really nice result that I'll cite that, tell, that states this mathematically. So it, it's a mathematically true fact, but why it's true of any linear smoother, I think, is not qu very intuitively true to me, at least. Um, so before I, I t tell you about their limitations, let me tell you about the things you'd use as alternatives to them. And those are what I would call locally adaptive methods. So when I say adaptive, I just mean locally, although I won't always say that word. And this is a fairly small class in comparison to the class of linear smoothers. It's still an active topic of research, too. But the prime example of a locally adaptive method is wavelet smoothing. That's one that we'll talk about now. Um, and then there's another method that we're going to talk about called locally adaptive regression splines. <coughs> 
And you can bet that because they are called this, they're locally adaptive. Otherwise, it would be a bad name. These are kind of, I'd say, two of the most common methods to do adaptive estimation. And the third one is relatively new that I think I'll try to talk about at least, which is called trend filtering. And it's very closely connected with the second one. So all alternatives to linear smoothers, when you think that you're estimating a function that has a mixed degree of smoothness, so let's talk about wavelets first. Wavelets are also very intricate, and I could, uh, could give much more details about wavelets, but let's just try to keep it simple. Um, yeah, wavelets were born in, in some sense out of the signal processing literature, and statisticians haven't always been involved with wavelet development, although um, I think some of the, the foremost statistical contributions did come from statisticians. So the, our understanding of wavelets comes entirely out of the statistics community. And wavelets are pretty finicky in the sense that they only work if we're in a pretty specialized situation. So that's my first disclaimer, which is that wavelets are adaptive. They can do better than linear smoothers, but you can't always use them. So wavelets are pretty limited to the dimension of the problem. There are higher dimensional extensions of wavelets, but they're much more complicated. And so let's just stick with the, the case when d is 1. Here are other major limitations. We're going to assume that the, the uh, points that we observe are evenly spaced. So we can't have random design points. Also a major limitation. Um, there are ways to get around this with wavelets, but you lose some of the computational properties. The last thing we're going to assume is that n is a power of 2. Okay, So now you might be looking at me like, I'm, I'm, what am I doing? I'm making up some toy problem. But I'm serious. This is for fast computations. People who do wavelets assume that n is a power of 2. And there are ways to get around this one. This one, I think, is probably the least. Um, this one can be relaxed the easiest. But we're just going to assume that n is a power of 2 for now. So if you're in a situation where you have equally spaced design points, you have 1,024 points, and you're in one dimension, and you have a function that's of mixed smoothness, then you might want to use wavelets, because they're, they're very good at this, in this regime. Um, and what's the basic idea? The basic idea is to form basis functions, just like we did in splines. But this is a wavelet basis, so it has a bit of a different property than uh, than splines do. In fact, one of the foremost properties they have is that these are always orthogonal. So if I were to, let's suppose I were to form a basis matrix W, just like I did with splines. I called it like B in splines, I think, or something like that, or G, I can't remember. But if I were to take uh, the, form the matrix by evaluating these basis functions over each column, so each column contains one of these wavelet bases functions um, evaluated at, at a different endpoint, point xi, then for wavelets, w is orthogonal. So in other words, it satisfies w transpose w equals the identity. It's one very special property of wavelets. Um, and here's the entire wavelet smoothing algorithm. It's uh, conceptually very simple to write down. The trick is in the details, which took a lot of research to make them work. But wavelet smoothing algorithm proceeds as follows. I just define some coefficients. Why? By multiplying by W transpose. This is sometimes called the wavelet transform. Then I define some coefficients um, theta hat by thresholding these. So I'm going to threshold theta in some way. And two common things to do are soft or hard thresholding. So I don't, did we talk about either of those things in this class yet? I can't remember. No? OK. So I'll just define those in a second. But basically, we're going to set some elements of this vector to 0. That's all we're doing. 
And when we set them equal to zero and we don't touch other elements, then this is called hard thresholding. If we set them to zero, some components to zero, and the other ones we make smaller, that's called soft thresholding. And then we build up our estimate y hat by just taking w times theta hat. This is sometimes called the backward, um, the inverse wavelet transform or the back wavelet transform. That's the whole algorithm. So it's simple to write down. Um, the notable things are that each of these multiplications are order n for wavelet bases. So even though this matrix is dense and it's n by n, you can actually multiply it by it in n operations as opposed to n squared, which would be the usual cost. Um, this is because of extremely kind of clever schemes that can be run on certain wavelet bases. So whenever you run wavelet now, uh, smoothing in software, you, know, you choose one from a list of wavelet bases, like a Haar basis or a Simlet basis. There's various different words for it. And what you're choosing, again, that affects what kind of functions you want to represent. So if you choose a very, you can maybe choose a very smooth simlet basis if you want to express um, you know, your function to be smooth. But in any one of one of a large dictionary of wavelet bases, they have these very clever multiplication schemes that do these steps in order n time. So they're extremely fast. And thresholding is you just go through each component at a time, and you either set it equal to 0 or you don't, essentially. And that's, all, that's also order n because right, we're just going to move through each of the end components. So the whole thing is, is very fast. It's linear time. And just to give you a perspective, this is even faster than a fast Fourier transform. This is so fast that wavelet transform is probably one of the fastest multiplication schemes we know how to do. Like you can do tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of points extremely easily with wavelet smoothing. Um, what does thresholding mean? Let me define that for you, just so that we have a picture that means precisely I'll just define soft thresholding, and then hard thresholding will follow anal analogously. So what we say is we say that theta hat is S of, call it lambda, of theta. So it's, I'm going to soft threshold theta at the level lambda. Lambda is a tuning parameter. So this is the tuning parameter for wavelets, just like all other methods that we've talked about have tuning parameters. And in other words, for each i, so for each component, I'm going to either subtract lambda from theta i if theta i was bigger than lambda. I'm going to set it equal to 0 if theta i was between minus lambda and lambda. Otherwise, I'm going to add lambda to theta i if it was smaller than minus lambda. So it's just um, either setting it to 0 if it's between minus lambda and lambda, where lambda is our tuning parameter or it's pushing it to 0 by an amount lambda. Hard thresholding, by the way, is ju just exactly this, except for we only set things to 0, and we don't, have, we don't move things to 0 by an amount lambda. Okay. So to get a better sense of what problem this is solving and why we want to do this, it actually helps to rewrite this algorithm, even though it's so simple, helps to rewrite it in a, um, another way. And I'm going to do that over here next to it. You can see it's actually performing a sparse regression. That's exactly what it's doing. I claim that theta hat minimizes the following loss function, which is uh, y minus w theta squared plus lambda times the L1 norm of w. If we use soft thresholding, I claim that it solves this problem with the 1 norm. And if we use hard threshold, and I claim it solves this problem with the zero norm. So let's just think about the one norm. OK, so if I told you, first of all, that I wanted to solve this problem, where the columns of w formed a basis for a, like the function space I was interested in, then you'd look at it and you'd say, ah, you're doing regression of y on the columns of w. So you're trying to find the best combination of basis functions that, to, uh, you know, under which I can express the data points that I'm seeing. That's something we already understand. But you're going to actually penalize those coefficients by the 1 norm, which means that you're going to try to set some of those coefficients to 0. So you're going to choose just a sparse number of basis functions that you're going to use to represent y. So we're going to only choose like a few of those wavelet um, basis functions when we're forming our best linear combination of them um, for y. 
And why is it the same as the program I wrote down? Well, because w is orthogonal, I can actually replace the loss by its multiplication with w transpose. Right? I can always multiply an orthogonal matrix by any vector, and it's normal at change. So I'm just going to multiply it by this. And I get that, right? W transpose y, and then W transpose W's identity, so it comes out being this. I claim that's the same as this. That was actually true regardless of what I had here. So if I had the zero, the L0 penalty here, that would be also true. It didn't matter what was over there. And I claim that the answer to this is just to soft threshold um, theta, uh, sorry. Y, uh, w transpose y by the level lambda. And maybe we'll put that as an exercise on the next homework. But that's um, something that you can kind of commonly see. And in our optimization course this semester, actually, we, we proved this. So it's, um, it's fairly short to see that. And if I had the 0 norm here, so the L0 norm, The L1 norm adds the, uh, it adds up the absolute components of theta. The L0 norm actually just counts the number of non-zeros that there are in theta. Right? So this is even more kind of a true notion of sparse regression. Because instead of just penalizing the magnitude of the coefficients, I'm actually penalizing the presence of any non-zero coefficient. And when I put the zero norm here, I claim that actually the answer is to do hard thresholding. So wavelet smoothing is either solving uh, this problem or the one with the zero norm, depending on whether or not we use hard or soft thresholding. If, uh, if that's not, if the notion of kind of sparse regression is confusing to you, then we'll, we'll talk about sparse regression in detail in, a, in the future. But I assume that you guys have seen something like this in 701, right? Did you guys learn knowledge your heads if you saw like something like this in 701? 705, did you learn sparse regression at all? No? Okay. But, uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll, like I said, we'll cover sparse regression in detail. Any questions about uh, the wavelet smoothing algorithm? Yeah. What happens to the hard thresholding uh, if theta is minus lambda or something? Here, you mean? Hard thresholding just doesn't add, doesn't do these shifts. So here, here's the picture. Probably you can just remember the picture, and then you don't have to remember the equation. The picture is um, soft thresholding of theta looks like this. So this is theta. What does its soft thresholded version look like if that's 0 and that's lambda and that's minus lambda? Well, I set it equal to 0 at every point between minus lambda and lambda. right? And then I just subtract off lambda if it's bigger than lambda, and I add lambda to it if it's smaller than minus lambda. So I'm just plotting the soft thresholding function just for one component as a function of lambda. Hard thresholding has the same region that it uses to set the component equal to 0, say, if it's, being, if it's hard threshold at the level lambda. But it just doesn't, it doesn't alter the components um, that are bigger or smaller than lambda. So it leaves the big components untouched, and it puts the small components at 0. There are just two different ways to perform thresholding. Oh, I mean, that's, not, that's kind of a boundary case. Um, that'll, that won't really happen, right? So lambda is something that I'm choosing. And uh, theta is w transpose y, which just comes from data. So usually it doesn't happen that it's exactly equal. But you could just choose one arbitrarily. Just choose some rule. They'll both be fine, yeah. Why would you choose one over the other? Hard versus soft thresholding? It's a good question. Um, the difference is. Uh, in a sense, again, the bias variance trade-off, which is something we've been harping on. But um, soft thresholding is biased. So I'm taking big components and I'm pushing them down, maybe unnecessarily, right? So if I were really to do a regression of um, y on the kind of the right sparse subset of w, then I'm getting regression coefficients with soft thresholding that are too small because they're being pushed down even though they're winning the competition of being bigger than lambda or smaller than minus lambda, they're still being pushed down. Um, hard threshold, on the other hand, doesn't do that. So it doesn't suffer from that bias, but it has higher variance. 
because it leaves these coefficients kind of far away from zero when they're being estimated and they can maybe be too variable. So people often use soft thresholding. Uh, and I think it's probably more common to use soft thresholding. It's the, it'll, we'll make the same comparisons when we talk about regression to using the lasso versus best subset selection. But they both have their limitations. Yeah? Uh, um, so yeah, I was kind of being a bit fast here. They, uh, they're not quite in the same scale between hard and soft thresholding, but they're close to the same scale. They don't have quite the same meaning, you're right, because this multiplies the magnitude of a coefficient, and this just tells you the presence of a coefficient being 0 or not. Oh, OK. So for soft thresholding, if I wanted to be really careful, and it's, it's right in the notes, if I were to add 2 lambda here, then this problem would be the same thing as, this is the same as soft thresholding at the level lambda. So solving this problem with 2 lambda and soft thresholding at level lambda are the same. For hard thresholding, and it's in the notes, solving this problem at the level lambda squared and, soft and hard thresholding by the level lambda are the same. Just replace the 1 norm with the 0 norm. Yeah? Um, yeah, it's a good question. So it can, because these wavelet bases functions, which I haven't, I haven't told you any wavelet bases so far. Um, but these wavelet bases functions, right? I wrote down these guys. These are actual functions. So what I get out is I get out theta uh, hat. And to make a new prediction, I just add a point x, which is a new point. I just take the appropriate linear combination of those basis functions. So just like we did for regression splines. Yeah? Um, yeah, we can always tune it. So, you know, this is a tuning parameter, right? So, I will have to choose it eventually, like I do with other methods, say by cross validation or by the um, optimism. Um, and I can always vary lambda and, and you know count the number of components I get that are non-zero, and then uh, formulate the question in that sense. But Theory for wavelets doesn't really correspond to people in practice. People usually have to tune them and practice according to cross validation or something like that. Is there another question somewhere? Yeah. Um, did you say anything more about why we're thresholding? Yeah, sure. So let me, let me, uh, let me draw a picture of the basis functions. Um, I don't think I have a picture in the notes. So this might be a really quite bad picture. But let's suppose I was trying to do estimation over 0, 1. Then wavelet basis, uh, basis functions essentially look like different transformations of the same kind of mother function. And uh, it's called the mother wavelet. And you know it might look like this guy, that guy, and then um, you know, some, another guy that's on 0 somewhere else. And then someone else that has twice as many wiggles and gets non-zero, and different patterns of location and also frequency. So essentially, I take many different transformations in terms of the location and the frequency of the same generic wavelet function, the mother wavelet, and that forms my basis. If I do this properly, the number one, this, this um, spans a big function space. So actually, I'm able to express many different relationships using this basis. And number two, it has the nice computational properties I talked about, like um, I can multiply very, very quickly the basis matrix I get from this. So there's a lot of finesse that goes into choosing these basis functions. But the point I wanted to get across was that after we choose them, suppose we chose th these basis functions and these, the ones I'm drawing, unless I'm forgetting what they look like, which is entirely possible, these are called simlets. Um, but there are different choices for um, different ba bases you can choose. We're trying to express y as some combination of these. right? And the weights theta correspond to the weights we're using when we're forming that combination. 
So if I had all the thetas being non-zero, then I'm actually using all the basis functions. So they're all active in some sense. But let's suppose I decided to place a big non-zero weight to the very these ones right here. Everything else was zero. And then I also placed a fairly substantial weight to this um, large, large basis function here. Then the combination I would get out would be something that looked like this. It was able to be wiggly in some region, and then it could be smooth for the rest. If all I did was place you know, high non-zero weight on these, this one, say, and that one. That may be desirable for representing some kind of mixed level of smoothness. So because we're throwing out all the other basis functions, we're just choosing a couple. We can choose the ones that are wiggly in the locations we want to be wiggly. We can choose the other ones that are smooth if we want the function to be smooth overall. This kind of behavior cannot be expressed by smoothing splines, for example. Even if you gave smoothing splines this basis, then if you remember what they do, they use a kind of L2 shrinkage versus an L1 shrinkage. So what happens is they, they take a non-zero combination of all the functions, and the weights may be small, but they're never non-zero. So they can't really ever express y as a sparse combination of the basis functions. That's why they're kind of limited in that sense. So that's the motivation for taking the, a sparse combination of basis functions. So kind of a nice segue into the strengths of uh, wavelets versus the limitations of linear smoothers. And I'll just tell you a little bit more about that theoretically, because um, I think it's, it's a very, this is a very big breakthrough in terms of adaptive regression. And uh, David Donahoe and Ian Johnstone wrote this paper that whose title I can't quite remember. I think it's called uh, Minimax Estimation via Wavelet Shrinkage or something. It's linked in the notes here. Um, it's a, quite a remarkable paper. It's very, very long. Um, and it says two things. It says that all you people so far have been considering function classes like these ones, the ones we've been considering so far which are like a holder class of, um, of functions, right? That we learned this, these guys have k minus 1 derivatives, and their k minus first derivative is Lipschitz with constant l. And you've been deriving results about estimators that are optimal with respect to this function class, like local polynomials, smoothing splines, et cetera. They all do well over this function class. This paper said that's too small. Most functions that you encounter, say, in, act in actual applications of uh, non-parametric regression, don't lie in that class because this class, in a sense, is restricted to functions that are either very smooth throughout or very wiggly throughout, but they can't express a mixed level of smoothness. And you can see that right in the formulation for the Lipschitz constant. It says that actually the function has to be Lipschitz with constant L after you take its k minus 1 derivatives. That means that in a sense, this kth derivative has to be bounded by L everywhere. So if I have its kth derivative being equal to L somewhere, it can be at most L every other places. So it's kind of a uniform notion of smoothness. And when L gets large, then it can be very large everywhere. I'm, allow I'm allowing the function to be you know, very wiggly everywhere. They said you should look at other function classes, ones that were extremely complicated, but I'm going to simplify um, to be this one. Uh, so instead of the holder class of functions, which we defined, they considered something that I'll call the total variation ball, which I'm going to write down as f. So instead of all functions, that have k derivatives, and the total variation of that function after you take its k derivatives is bounded by L. It's a different notion of smoothness. Um, turns out, maybe for reasons that are somewhat beyond this particular lecture, this is a lot bigger than this function class. And in fact, you can show that fkl is bigger than not only the holder class, but the holder class of one higher order. The constants change, but that doesn't matter, because we usually don't care about the constants. So this is an even bigger, if you assume that your function is, um, has k derivatives, and this k derivative is, has bounded variation, total variation, um, that's an even weaker assumption than assuming it has k plus 1 derivatives and its k plus second f uh, first derivative is Lipschitz. And this is not uh, an equality. It's actually a strict containment. 
That's an even harder problem to consider. And so they said, stop considering minimax estimation over this. Start considering minimax estimation over this. Start considering estimation over this. And the result is stated as follows. The result is that the minimax rate over FKL is on the order of n to the minus 2k plus 2 over 2k plus 3. So it looks kind of similar to things you've seen before, except for the, you can write that more cleanly, the actual exponents change. That's a lower bound for how well you can do over that big function class. And so that, that was the lower bound. And wavelets achieve this. If you choose a certain wavelet basis to have the right level of smoothness, smoothness here being reflected by k, you get this, this optimal performance by wavelets. But moreover, uh, any linear estimator This is the, a pretty remarkable result. Any linear estimator, doesn't matter which one it is, anything where you get y hat being s times y has the following lower bound on its, uh, has error that's lower bounded by n to the minus 2k plus 1 over 2k plus 2. some constant times this. So not only can you not get the optimal performance with linear estimators over these bigger classes, you're actually bounded away from the optimal rate by this gap. And the ratio between these two rates goes to infinity. So you need infinitely more samples with a linear estimator when you're trying to estimate a, mixed, a function with mixed smoothness in this big function class, uh, FKL. Infinitely many more samples are required in a relative sense than if you use something like wavelets that are adaptive. And it's remarkable because it didn't even say which linear estimators. It didn't pick out smoothing splines and, and kernels, et cetera, and study them individually. It just applies to the whole class. And so it's a very, I think it's very rare that results like this are, are able to be shown that are so, so broad but still so kind of definitive. So it really dampened people's enthusiasm in linear uh, when using linear estimators for uh, you know, non parametric regression where the underlying function is kind of unknown in terms of its level of smoothness. Um, so that, this is a very important paper. It's one of the reasons why I like to use wavelets. And I'll just say it as a source of motivation. So two other things that achieve this rate are locally adaptive regression splines and trend filtering. They're also optimal. Also achieve this. That's a big source of, mo of motivation for these two methods. However, unlike wavelets, these guys aren't restricted by the same problems that we've done before, which is that, I don't know if they're erased. Yeah, it's been erased. The points have to be evenly spaced. The number of points has to be a power of two, and so forth. So these actually are more generic. So in that sense, they're maybe more flexible. Now, to be fair, there's a lot of theory for wavelets that's, that's, that goes beyond this that makes them sound very, very compelling to use in the cases when they apply that these guys don't have established. So I'm, just, I'm not, I'm not uh, trying to dump on wavelets unnecessarily, just trying to say that um, these are two more recent developments. So this one is as recent as maybe late 2000s, and this one is a little, later, a little earlier, but still after wa well after wavelets that have the same optimality properties. Any questions? Yeah? Uh, is that minimax rate, its dependence on dimension, is it similar to what we saw earlier? Uh, that's a good question. So this is all for d equals 1. For d greater than 1, it's unknown. Everything is unknown. In fact, all of these function classes aren't even defined. I mean, the holder one is, but this one isn't. 
So it's, yeah, adaptive regression high dimensions is a very kind of underdeveloped field. If you wanted to do your class project on that, that would be a good thing to study. Yeah. Yes, so they do, that's right, so that's a good question. So we can actually do the calculation here. Um, what's the minimax rate for that class? Uh, it's, it's actually, you can see it's, so remember, we, we studied this already. It's n to the minus 2 times whatever the value of smoothness is over 2 times that plus 1. That thing here is k plus 1. So it ends up being 2 times k plus 1, which is 2k plus 2, over 2 times that thing plus 1 ends up being 2k plus 3. So actually, if you were to apply like traditional methods, linear smoothers, to this, you do get the optimal rate. They give you this. But once you move them to this function class, which is bigger, they, they don't have their worst case error rate. It blows up. It gets, gets inflated up to this. It's a good question. The, the other ones all assume this guy. So they all work with this bigger function class as well. Let's take a break, a quick break, and then we'll come back and we'll figure out whether we're going to actually talk about locally adaptive regression splines and trend filtering or move on. OK. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have a joke for you today. I've been trying to think of a joke involving trend filtering, but it's, it's escaped me. But I do have a choice for you, so that'll be in place of the joke, which is, um, I actually, let's just pull the class. We have two options. The first option is that we don't talk about locally adaptive regression science and trend filtering. It's in the notes. You can read about it if you're interested. I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, I'm fine with either option. I'm biased, of course, because I like certain topics more than others. But um, that's option one. And we don't talk about them. And we just kind of quickly talk about what to do in high dimensions. Option two is that we go through trend filtering and locally adaptive regression splines in detail. And then next time we talk about what to do in high dimensions. And we spend a little more time on that as well. So the, the calendar has us supposed to be finishing non parametric regression today. We can, afford, we can afford one more lecture if it's wanted. So let's um, take a poll of hands people who want to finish up non parametric regression today, I'm not going to next time. I won't be offended, trust me. <laughs> I'll, OK, I won't even try to look at your faces. I'll blur my eyes. <laughs> Who wants to continue and talk about? OK, I think that wins. So OK, good choice. All of you guys get Fs who decided not for it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so locally adaptive regression splines. So now this is kind of interesting because we're we're honing in on like a few papers. So splines, I can't tell you who invented splines. I mean, the references go back to like the 30s and 40s maybe even. Um, kernels, very, very old. Wavelets are very, very old. Now we're getting into stuff where like there's just one paper that proposed this method. So we're getting into kind of research, uh, current research territory. And the paper is referenced in the, in the notes, lecture notes. It's uh, Mammon and Vandegear from 1997. And I think it's a very nice method. And um, I'll tell you what it looks like in two different forms. One in the kind of infinite dimensional functional minimization form that we've seen for smoothing splines in RKHS. And the other, again, it's like this remarkable result where we say that we have actually a finite dimensional minimizer for that. So let's just talk about the functional form first. This, may start, this is looking like a specific case of one of the RKHS estimators, but it's actually, I'm almost certain. In fact, yeah, I guess I'd say I'm 99% certain that this is, does not form uh, an RKHS. So it actually lies outside of that case, even though it has a similar form. So we want to minimize over all functions. Least squares error to y, it's our typical term, plus a different functional, which measures roughness. and this guy takes the kth derivative of the function in question and takes its total variation. 
That's what we're doing. Let's think about what we did for smoothing spines. Smoothing spines, remember, they took some derivative of f, end up being actually k plus 1 over 2, I believe, that order. And it took its square and it integrated it across the domain. That's what the smoothing spine penalty was. Remind you, this one's different. How does this differ? Well, total variation. Um, the precise definitions in the notes. Uh, how many people have seen total variation in the operator before? Okay, some problem. Doesn't seem like everybody's seen it. Uh, I'll just I'll just define it. Why not? We're going to be talking about this reset. So, the total variation of a function is the supremum over all partitions. So suppose this function is defined on AB. I look at all partitions um, of AB. So T1 through Tm. M here is arbitrary. Any partition. It can be infinitely large. Of the sum of f at, say, Tj minus f at Tj minus 1, an absolute value, j going from, uh, I guess here, 2 through m. So I, I try to take a partition of its domain, and I look at the absolute differences in the function across the, the, the boundary points of that partition. And I add that up. That's a measure of its, its wiggliness. It's, 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 and it's known as its total variation. And so the total variation actually takes the worst case overall partitions. What you can show is that if f is differentiable, this is defined even if f is not differentiable. It's defined for any function. But if f is not differentiable, this is actually equal to, so when differentiable, this is equal to the integral over its domain. Say here, again, like we said, is ab of the absolute value of f of t dt. So then we can think about this penalty as kind of the same as. It's not exactly the same, because this is overall functions you know, that have k derivatives. We're not saying the k derivative has to be differentiable. But when it is, it looks like this. The absolute value of fk plus 1 to the t, or I guess I'll call it x here, dx. So compare those two penalties. Right, this one's taking the some higher order derivative, squaring it, integrating it. This one is taking some higher order derivative effectively, taking its absolute value and integrating it. So it looks like the functional equivalent, functional comparison between, say, the L2 penalty and the L1 penalty that we've seen in regression. And we will see in regression again later when we talk about sparse regression. So it's an interesting change of perspective. And now you can kind of guess as to what, how it's going to become adaptive, because it's, it's trying to uh, use a more uh, adaptive-like penalty, this L1 penalty, but in, the, in a function sense. So that's the minimization problem. Um, k is a, the choice of the order of smoothness, just like it is with smoothing splines. But here k can be anything. So it can be 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. We don't need to restrict it to it being odd. So it, it can be anything. And when k equals 0 or, or 1, we have this remarkable result that says that f hat is a kth order spline. with knots in x1 through xn. So this is kind of like our result for um, smoothing splines. It's a very nice result for locally adapted regression splines. So remember, if you tell me the knots are at these points, then I can just write down a basis for splines at those, that are of order k at those points. And so I can turn this into a finite dimensional minimization problem. I'm just trying to find the coefficients of f in that basis expansion. When k is bigger than 1, so when k is bigger than or equal to 2, there's actually still this very nice result that tells us that f hat is a kth order spline. 
But here's the, the problem. It's knots we don't know. So it's knots could lie in between the data points, for example. So for a little while, I, I believe, um, people were, at least the authors for a little while, were stumped as to what to do. Because they have this very nice procedure, local adaptive regression spline estimator, with very nice properties that we'll, we can talk about. But I already told you the punchline, which is that it's minimax optimal. Um, but when you want to fit smooth functions, you don't actually know where, uh, a knot set that, that contains knots of its minimizer. So I, I, you can't really write down a basis for, for um, the, the minimizer in the case when k is big and equal to 2. So the, the kind of the hack, the solution, but it's, it's kind of a hack, is just to focus our attention um, on k splines. So when you're trying to solve that problem, just focus your attention on k splines with knots in x1 through xn. So in other words, instead of minimizing over all functions here, just minimize over functions that are kth order splines that have knots at x1 through xn, even when k is bigger than or equal to 2. When k is 0 or 1, we haven't lost anything we know by doing that. That's this result. When k is bigger than or equal to 2, you know, we may have lost something. It may be a better function according to this criterion. Um, but it's still a spline of order k. We just don't know it's not, so we'll just pretend like it's not. It must be in uh, the set of data points. And luckily, actually, I think another very nice result of this paper, it shows that you don't lose too much by doing this. So it's still optimal in terms of its convergence rates. Uh, it just requires a few more conditions. So this one is, the solution to that one is, has a very kind of provably very good uh, error rate. For, for this guy, where we restrict our attention to have just knots of the data points, it requires a few more conditions. Like, it requires that these data points don't be too crazily spaced. But for most practical purposes, this is the one you can use. And you don't lose very much by doing so. So something I showed in the notes here, um, which you can go through, which we're not going to go through for the sake of time, is that um, this problem is the same as the following problem, which I'm just going to let f be a linear combination. I call it theta. I call it beta of uh, basis functions, gj. And so these are basis functions for the space of kth order splines with knots of x1 through xn. We already learned, for example, about those guys. We could take these to be the truncated power basis. And when we take those to be the truncated power basis, we get a very nice expression for that, um, for that criterion, which is that th this problem is the same thing as minimizing overall choices of coefficient vectors. Now we're turning into finite dimensional form. Truncated power basis with knots at x1 through xn. That problem's the same as this one. That, this part shouldn't surprise you. Right, the fact that I can write the loss like this, we've seen this a bunch of times. This is, the columns of these are just the basis uh, functions evaluated over the input points. And these are the coefficients in that basis expansion. What does that look like? So something very special happens when we use the truncated power basis. And this starts looking like things we, we saw with wavelets. It's just the sum of the absolute values of the coefficients, which I'm calling beta here. So it's like the L1 norm of beta. The only difference, the reason I wrote it like this, is that we actually don't sum up uh, the absolute values of all the components of beta, just everyone after k plus 2. Because if you remember, what are the first k plus 1 truncated power basis 
functions, they are just polynomials. So I don't actually want to penalize their coefficients. They don't contribute to any amount of wiggliness or not selection or anything. I don't want to penalize the polynomials. I'll let them to be fit kind of in, in full. And we also learned from last time, every basis function for the truncated power basis that's of, of you know, the jth function, when j is bigger than k plus 2, k plus 2 through n, these look like um, dj right, k plus 1 plus j of x was equal to x minus tj to the k in positive part. So the presence or absence of this function determines whether or not we use t, tj as a knot. And for the truncated power basis, remember, we're actually taking that to be the data points. So the presence or absence of this function determines whether or not we're using a knot at xj. So now this ties back into something we talked about with splines. This is actually estimating a spline. And in fact, what we think is a, the kind of the best fitting spline to our data. But instead of doing it with the, uh, uh, like we do with smoothing splines, where we penalize the coefficients through some kind of L2 penalty. Remember, with, with smoothing splines, just to remind you, the penalty looked like this, lambda, beta, transpose, some matrix times beta. We're actually penalizing it according to the L1 norm of those coefficients. And what we know about the L1 norm is that at the solution, some of these will be 0. So we'll actually select out some of the truncated power basis functions exactly to produce knots in our fit. So this is like. Uh, so this is actually doing knot selection in splines. So that's the, that's the method. Now you might see how you could solve it in software, say. Um, you, you, know, you have to form this matrix G, which is something you can do if you know the truncated power basis, the equations in the notes. And then you'd run kind of the lasso solver. This is like pretty much a lasso regression problem, right? Just like wavelets were also, wavelets had a, a, an orthogonal basis here um, that had very special properties in terms of their computation. Locally adaptive regression splines stick in a, a, a bit different basis matrix. It doesn't have those nice properties, but you can still solve it in, in software. And they have, you know, the thing we've already said, I'll just write down one more time, is that this estimator, f hat, that we get out of it, which we get by taking beta hat of gj, it has the optimal n to the minus 2k plus 2 over 2k plus 3 rate over this big function class, fkl. That was um, one of the main results of that paper. But more broadly applicable than wavelets because we don't need to assume anything about the x's here, the number of uh, points, et cetera. Any questions about locally adaptive regression splines? OK, um, that will wrap it up for today. Uh, next time, I guess, we'll talk about trend filtering, which tries to take locally adaptive regression splines and move you towards the computational efficiency of smoothing splines. So these can be slow to do in software. You have a homework due on Friday, I think, right? Homework and project proposal. So remember to do those things, of course.